I'll turn it over to Carla, who's going to introduce today's speaker. <coughs> So it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Tom McCormick, who's an associate professor at Occidental College and director and curator at the Moore Lab of Zoology, which he's going to be talking about. And John just uh, emailed us a couple of months ago about doing research <coughs> in our archives. Um, he's interested in, he's here looking at here and also at the Bancroft looking at, um, at old correspondence and field notes trying to uncover sort of fun facts and stories about Grinnell and early naturalists in the LA area. And it's happened that we had a, a busy lunch opening, so he graciously agreed to give us a talk. Um, so John got his bachelor's at the University of Arizona and his PhD at UCLA working with Tom Smith, who was a former PhD student here, um, starting out with Ned Johnson and then finishing with Frank Patelka. So we figured out this morning, as a fun fact, that that makes John Grinnell's great-great-grandson and my academic great-great-grandson. <laughs> that would be an interesting story. <laughs> yeah. 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 My <laughs> academic <laughs> nephew. That's um, right. Yeah. Um, John has a really strong program in involving undergraduates in his research. He's got a strong publication record, over 58 publications, lots of grants, including, I guess, a current grant on um, an undergraduate driven um, program effort to develop a genomic center at Occidental or at the lab. And um, another fun fact, he spent last summer in the Galapagos with his family um, having fun and doing some research. He also coaches his four-year-old son's baseball team. You could call it that, I guess. And um, <laughs> he's going to talk to us about some secrets in the um, world's largest Mexican bird collection at the Moore Lab. So Thanks. Great to have you, John. Thanks. I'll try not to talk about baseball. <laughs> it might be a sore subject right now. Um, so thank you so much for, for having me here. Um, I was here giving the MDZ lunch talk uh, seven years ago. It was, so I guess it's kind of like an update on what I've been up to after I got to Occidental <coughs> College in the Moore Lab. Um, one place I like to start is uh, answer the question, where is Occidental <laughs> College? Um, we are right here in uh, northeast Los Angeles, right next to Pasadena, and uh, you got downtown uh, down in this area, so it's a kind of a nice hilly part of northeast LA, not too far away from the San Gabriels. That's a small liberal arts institution. 2,000 undergraduates were probably best known for one of our most famous students being uh, <laughs> President Obama. Went there for two years before he transferred to Columbia. Um, so uh, we're a small school with this big bird collection, which kind of is interesting. So Northeast LA is known, it's got a lot of you know, cultural and historical um, background to it, but probably part of that that is not as well known, and one of the reasons I'm here digging around in the archives, is its importance to the development of natural history in the West and the Southwest. Um, and this kind of goes back to the time of John Muir. Uh, John Muir loved to come down to LA. His, his time in LA is not very well storied, but he spent a lot of time in the Pasadena area um, starting in the 1870s. So he um, had a couple friends who were teachers of his when he was at Madison, the University of Wisconsin. So they were professors that were there that eventually relocated to the Pasadena area and um, they would visit him. And so this kind of gets into some of the differences in how um, the Bay Area versus Los Angeles grew and, and developed. And if you can kind of generalize, San Francisco was settled by a lot of maybe single men who were coming to make their fortunes in the gold rush. Um, and uh, Los Angeles was really pretty different. It was about two, three decades later in the 1880s that LA really got well settled. And it was settled by a lot of rich, sort of well-educated families that were coming either for health reasons or just to find a nicer climate. And so um, Muir was hanging out with some of those people and, um, and, and found the people that moved there found this really nice natural area that wasn't um, you know, very well developed at that time. So that involved being very close to this amazing mountain range, the San Gabriel Mountains, which at that time was just, they called it the Sierra Madre, the mother range. 
and um, this beautiful drainage that came out of the San Gabriel is called the Arroyo Seco. And so the children of the families that moved to that area kind of grew up with this myth of John Muir, who is still kind of in living memory and already sort of a legend. And they grew up in this incredible natural surroundings. Um, by that time, they were had already built this incredible railway that went up into the San Gabriel. So just an absolute amazing feat that they built this thing in the late 1800s. It was already basically completely destroyed and gone by the 1930s. This is what the Arroyo Seco looked like back in those days. And, um, and so this was all kind of percolating around. And the Arroyo Seco especially has been sort of well described historically as being an epicenter of culture in the area. So with the arts and um, with sort of Southwest history and uh, architecture as well. Uh, arts and crafts movement, people were going there and building these amazing craftsman homes. It kind of developed almost like a <coughs> bohemian culture, but of course, you know, uh, with a little more wealth associated to it. Um, one of the people who was growing up as a kid in that area was Joseph Grinnell. So he, he was, um, came to Pasadena as a young boy. His parents moved from Oklahoma. And he found himself kind of in this natural wonderland with the, the myth of, of John Muir still kind of fresh on the scene. Muir was even still alive at that time. And so Grinnell was just kind of like a, like a child prodigy in naturalism. His dad was a doctor, very well-known member of Pasadena Society. His mother um, was writing articles about birds and natural history, and she really um, advocated for him going into, into natural history. And, you know, maybe from what I've been reading, might have been the first example of like a helicopter mom. Um, <laughs> that's a bit of an anachronism, you know, maybe a better word back then, something like a dirigible mom. <laughs> So, um, Grinnell was growing up in, in this period, and, um, and he wasn't the only one. So if we kind of go back to the map, um, in the blue triangles, I've got some of the places where Muir liked to hang out. In fact, one of the homes he would stay at of the uh, Gene and Ezra Carr, now it's that, uh, if you watch the Rose Parade, where they have the big stands and where the floats do their big turn, um, that's like right where John Muir would stay. That's almost like right where the house was. And he would also go visit his friend, another naturalist and writer, John Burroughs, who had a cabin up in the Eaton Canyon area where that other blue triangle is. Um, Grinnell grew up where the yellow triangle is. Lots of other ornithologists and naturalists associated with the MBZ also grew up in this area. Kind of remarkable. Um, Walter P. Taylor. Um, got uh, Alden Miller, who grew up in a house right along the Arroyo Seco. Of course, his dad, Loy Miller, was a professor at UCLA, um, so that's not too surprising that they were there. Uh, Harry Swarth, Chester Lamb, um, actually grew up a little bit south more towards where USC is now. Joe T. Marshall, who actually, um, he was a little later, I mean, 1920s, but he actually just passed away really recently, in 2015. Really bummed that I never got a chance to, to talk to him. And then some other people that um, might not be quite as well known to you because they're not MBZ folks, um, but Adrian Van Rossum, really well known bird taxonomist. Again, another house right along the Arroyo Seco. And um, Donald R. Dickey, um, another fellow who started his own private collection, eventually got associated with Caltech, and um, also grew up right along the Arroyo Seco. So kind of remarkable, this area. I mean, it's one thing, I think, to be at a, a university, and you look around and say, okay, Grinnell lived here, someone lived there. Yeah, it's because they were at the university. It's another thing to say that all this is where all these people grew up as children. Clearly, there was something in the air, there was something in the culture that was created. So that's something I've been kind of interested in. So the founder of the Moore Laboratory of Zoology 
uh, Robert T. Moore, he came pretty late along the scene. I think he moved to Los Angeles in 19, about 1928. And um, he did so with a with kind of a splash. He had just <coughs> gone on this expedition to Ecuador. He had climbed some of the highest mountains there, Chimborazo and Mount Sangai. And then he arrived to LA, kind of a big announcement in the LA Times of this naturalist explorer who was coming to Los Angeles to study birds and um, bringing his birds with him. He was kind of an anachronism himself in a lot of ways, you know, this sort of adventure naturalist mold was something that was sort of fading through time and he was sort of out of place in, in the 1920s and kind of being back in that mold um, of the Victorian era. And uh, Ostensibly, he moved to LA to start a fox farm. He was into <laughs> fox farming for the for the fur trade. It's something he did from where he came from in Maine, and he wanted to start, and he did start a fox farm for silver foxes up near Big Bear <clears throat> in the San Gabriel. So that was kind of his business, and then his hobby on the side. Of course, he was very wealthy, came from family money, and on the side he was going to study the birds of Mexico. That's kind of where he set his sights. And so to do this, he hired um, Chester Lamb, who worked for the MBZ for a number of years before he started working for Moore, was originally from LA. Uh, he's pictured here uh, sitting on his early expeditions to Baja with the MBZ in the 1920s and, and early 1930s. Robert T. Moore hired him in 1933 to basically be his collector in Mexico. And um, the successes of that were pretty much immediately apparent. Um, more Chester Lamb found and collected and more described this spectacular new species of jay, new to Western science, of course, uh, the tufted jay from the mountains of the Sierra Madre Occidental. And then over the next 22 years, Lamb lived and worked in Mexico and collected over 49,000 specimens for more, um, essentially blanketing all of Mexico during this time. So we've got this, I mean, the bulk of our collection, we've got 65,000 bird specimens. Um, by the end, about 55,000 of those are, are from Mexico. So we're really focused on a distinct place and a, and a distinct <coughs> More at that time, you know, he was also indifferent in that he lived kind of further over in eastern Pasadena, where kind of the, the old money was. You know, these were the blue bloods that came from the east coast. They didn't mix with the bohemian types that lived over by the Arroyo Seco here. And he was stashing his specimens in his house. Uh, Feature down at the bottom is really stately house. I would love to go to the current owners of those of that house and tell them that 50,000 bird corpses used to be in there. <laughs> what that would do for property values, you know, it's like one person dies in a house, you know, trying to hide that so it doesn't drive down the price, 50,000 birds. So uh, eventually in the early 50s, he decided he need to get, needed to get his bird collection hooked up with some sort of institution that would live on after him. And so uh, by that time, Caltech was too far along the tech, and they had gone away from natural history. The Dickey collection had left Caltech and ended up at UCLA. And so he approached Occidental College, um, I think maybe because they had had some Presbyterian affiliations in the past, and he was a Presbyterian. And he put up the money to have a building built, the Moore Laboratory of Zoology there, in 1951. And he worked there, um, not as a professor, but just working on his birds um, until he died in 1958. So what we are doing now is basically trying to carry on that legacy and finish some of the work that Robert T. Moore did with new tools. Um, we recently dove into a big remodel of the Moore Lab, and just before we moved all the cases from how they originally were when Moore was there. We had to reset up this classic photo of Moore working in the lab with, you know, 
fashions have changed a little bit. <laughs> the suit has been replaced with the Dodgers. Yeah, but, but we're trying to carry on that legacy and sort of finish finish what he started in terms of working on just the stuff, the, just the, the nuts and bolts of what museums do. Taxonomy and systematics of Mexican birds. Of course, updating that with DNA data and GIS data. We do work on species, speciation and species limits, hybrid zones, um, looking at landscape drivers of diversification, and then getting into some more of the, the, the modern questions of um, gene flow being very important to the process of speciation and some of these ancient histories of gene flow that we're now able to detect with genomic data. And then also using the collection, much like you have done uh, with the Grinnell Resurvey Project, looking at change over historical time, change to bird distributions, and also change to, to bird DNA. So in the course of this talk, I say we a lot, and I just want to tell you who I'm referring to here. This is a photo from our recent resurvey trip to the mountains of northern Baja. Um, the core of the lab is me and then James Maley, who's the collections manager. It's a permanent staff position. And Whitney Sai, who is the lab manager. And she's going to be leaving us soon to start a PhD at UCLA. I'm very scared about how I'm going to replace her. She's been there for the last six years, and she's really the, the knowledge center of the DNA lab. And then we have a postdoc right now, Ryan Terrell. He's on one of these NSF postdoc fellowships. And we don't have a graduate program there, so we really rely on a cohort of really awesome undergraduates. This was kind of the most recent crop, some of whom have now graduated and gone on to places like um, the EEB PhD program at KU for Devon. Um, Maggie is a lab manager of the DNA lab at University of Rhode Island. And um, you know, we send our undergrads off to a lot of these graduate programs. So where I was seven years ago, and I know I've done something over that time because my entire talk then I've now condensed <coughs> into one slide. <laughs> Good place to be. Um, I got to the Moore Lab at kind of the, the perfect time, kind of in my own career. So what I had been doing just before I got there was developing molecular methods that um, could be used to pull out lots of genomic data uh, from all kinds of vertebrates. And it could also be used on museum specimens. So this stuff is all kind of like old hat by now. But um, we developed this concept of using ultra-conserved parts of DNA uh, that we designed by lining up the genomes. Um, our collaborator, Brant Faircloth, is the one who actually designed the probes. By lining up genomes of things like lizard, zebrafinch, and chicken. At the time, these were like some of the only genomes that were out there closely related to birds. It's amazing to think of how far we've come in just 10 years. And finding these ultra-conserved regions that we could then use as anchors to go in and attach to and pull out DNA from a variety of non-model organisms. So birds and mammals and all the way out to things like frogs and <coughs> fish. So we had described these uh, UCE markers in a couple publications and sort of done proof of concept to show that it would work and we could create phylogenies out of the variation that was in the flanking parts that we would pull out from the probes because the center part is very conserved. And so that's where I came in to the Moore Lab and um, decided to, to start applying these UCEs to, to Mexican systematics. So I got a grant right after I got there with um, John Klicka, is a, a grant to look at um, comparative phylogeography across the Mexican highlands. It's a subject that he and I had both been interested in over a number of years. And now we could use these UCEs to go in and look at them with genomic level data. So I want to just walk you through um, one of the first organisms we looked at. Of course, what do you do when you get these great new genomic tools, but you go straight back to what your PhD was on, and you pull out those old samples from the freezer, and you say, okay, I'm going to apply the new method to these. So I had worked on Mexican jays for a number of years, mostly with mitochondrial DNA. And what we had found with mitochondrial DNA 
is evidence for really deep divergences across the Mexican highlands with no evidence for gene flow in mitochondrial DNA among those regions. So each of these mountain regions was monophyletic and you never found a haplotype in the wrong place. But I had some information from microsatellite DNA that maybe this wasn't the whole story. So I think I sequenced 15 microsatellite loci and it was only in one locus that there was this really interesting pattern. Down here in this group that was in the transvolcanic range at this locus, most of the alleles were about 400 base pairs. <coughs> and then in all the northern lineages, that same locus, the alleles were about 100 base pairs. So it looked like there had been some kind of macro mutation that had happened, either to lengthen or shorten this microsatellite locus, and it had become fixed in these two different lineages. The only place that deviated from that pattern was in the southern part of the range of this lineage where you could find intermediate range allele sizes. And the frequency of those alleles decreased as you moved away from the border um, between these two lineages. So you'd find them in really high frequency here, less frequency as you moved north, and even up in Arizona, I sequenced maybe 40 J's, and there was one J that was a heterozygote for a large allele. There was only one allele copy of that larger allele that was found up there. Evidence that there had maybe been some gene flow happening between these two, and it had been long enough ago that those alleles would recombine, maybe get a little bit shorter as they recombined, and travel north through um, you know, just random gene flow, because these birds don't migrate, they don't get a, around a lot. So, I kind of had this little hint that maybe there had been these ancient histories of gene flow that the mitochondrial DNA was just sort of covering up. So we looked at it with these genomic markers, and what I'm showing you here is a phylogeny, a species tree, um, built from about 2,500 SNPs that we mined out of these UC loci. And um, I'm showing you the posterior distribution of trees from a species tree method called SNAP. And what we found is that in areas that are kind of fuzzy of this posterior distribution, it can give you some hints as to where gene flow might be happening. And so sure enough, one area that came out real fuzzy um, was this Site 6, which was over here very close to the range border between two lineages. And in fact, the two individuals that we sequenced from Site 6 looked like, even though in mitochondrial DNA they went with the blue group, in their nuclear DNA they had um, assignments to both the blue group and the green group. So this was another area where we hadn't really suspected there was gene flow going on, um, but it turned out in the nuclear genome there was. Now, those groups where we saw the evidence for introgression in the microsatellites, that would be this group down here and then all the rest, kind of that this place right here. We didn't see any evidence for introgression in this SNAP species tree, but when we conducted more fine scale tests using this um, ABABA test or D-statistic, we did find elevated evidence for gene flow between this group and the rest. And then in places where there was never any hypothesized gene flow, um, for instance in A up there between the blue and the yellow group, um, we found some instances where we definitely did not uh, discover any gene flow. So we kind of had like a positive and a negative control. So the story here was kind of uncovering these ancient histories, these sort of hidden histories of gene flow with genomic markers, which seems to be a recurring uh, story, um, especially in birds. We also had a lot of um, reptiles and amphibians that we were looking at. Mostly this was done um, in John Klicka's lab, uh, his postdoc, Rob Bryson, um, incredibly prolific, publishing um, phylogeographies of reptiles and amphibians in the Mexican highlands. Not going to give you uh, a lot of the story here, but kind of the big picture from these studies is that you don't see a lot of evidence for gene flow among the mountain ranges in reptiles and amphibians, and um, also 
much older divergences within things that are currently described as species groups. So we haven't worked up a sort of full-scale comparative, like quantitative comparative overview of the study. We're still kind of cranking out some of the single species stuff. But if I could sort of give you the, the broad story, it's probably in birds. We're finding more gene flow, more recent species histories. Um, whereas in reptiles, there's deeper divergence and a lot more cryptic diversity. Now, recently, we've been doing some studies of birds in the cloud forests of the same area, and we have found some pretty deep divergences in birds. So I just wanted to highlight a few of these because these are newer studies we've done, kind of excited about. One of these is in unicolored jays. So this is a, kind of one of the forgotten members of the genus of Bellacoma. Uh, that's in these isolated cloud forest patches down in southern Mexico and down into Central America. And when we sequenced these guys, uh, they had really deep and old divergence for a bird um, across the Isthmus of Tehuantepec here, getting back to um, you know as old as three and a half million years. So this is pushing things back sort of out of the realm of the Ice Ages and more maybe into um, Pleistocene cooling, or maybe even some of the completion of mountain building in this region, which you normally don't find for birds. These guys are also a real conundrum for species limits. Um, if you really wanted to get you know, uh, into the, the idea that if you can find monophyletic groups and if you can find phenotypic differences, then yeah, you should call them a species. These guys are a great group for that. I mean, they're all diagnostic in their phenotype. They're all deeply divergent in their genetics. But at the same time, I do kind of get the idea, you know, you look at these guys, they kind of look the same. They're all in cloud forest. Do you want to keep them as one species or do you want to split them up? We're advocating for the moment that at least you would want to make a split across the Isthmus of Tehuantepec and even among the three lineages here to the north. Um, so we've suggested four species out of what was once one. Uh, another group that we've looked at is uh, the wood partridges. These are also a not really a, a well-known species because you don't see them very often. They're very secretive, but kind of a large quail-like bird. And um, they are found in almost the same areas that the unicolored jays are. And in fact, when we sequenced them and dated their divergence time, their divergence also dates and splits across the isthmus right about the same time as the unicolored jays. So sometime in the, in the Pliocene, about three and a half million years ago. So another example of deep divergences in a bird across some of these Mexican and Central American mountain ranges. And it's not too surprising. Both of these birds are really sedentary species. They don't migrate. They don't fly well. They don't get around a lot. And so we think that they can, they have something, sort of a special history to tell us about the historical connections among these cloud forests in uh, Mesoamerica. So that's kind of where we were. Um, and you'll notice what we hadn't done a lot of in any of these studies was use museum specimens. We were mostly using modern uh, specimens that John Clicka had collected during the course of his field work over the last several decades. But then the question became, well, how do we really incorporate these more lab specimens into more of the work that we're doing? And um, you know, for any of you who were doing work on ancient DNA before the genomic era, you know that it was pretty labor intensive and pretty frustrating. Over time, genomic DNA fragments, and as those specimens sit there on the shelf, it just shreds into smaller and smaller pieces. It gets degraded. And what you would have to do if you were using Sanger sequencing was design not just primers across one large area, but as that DNA got fragmented up, you'd have to design these internal primers where you'd be sequencing smaller and smaller pieces, and you'd have to rinse and repeat to kind of go all the way across the whole genomic region. And it was just very time intensive. It didn't always work. It was kind of touchy. You know, you're designing primers across regions that were variable, and so your primers wouldn't work across species. Multiple times the work 
for the same <coughs> fragment, and you'd have to repeat that for every locus. The great part about the sequence capture method with UCEs or whatever other probes you might want to use is that um, it's perfectly designed to be worked with shredded DNA. In fact, even if you have high quality genomic DNA, the first step you do is to um, sonicate and fragment up the DNA. So working with this ancient DNA from museum specimens was, was quite easy. You've got that fragmented DNA, um, you add the probes in, you can do it for several different individuals or species, and then you wash the stuff you don't want away and you pull out the DNA that's attached to those probes. And so this kind of has really, I think, transformed the use of museum specimens. It's kind of shining new light on the uses um, of museum specimens in genomics. And of course, you guys know this the best because you're some of the pioneers of using that ancient DNA um, or historical DNA in the Grinnell Resurvey Project to look at change through time. Mexico, as compared to California, had its time of major habitat impacts um, actually much more uh, recently than in California. So of course, uh, the indigenous people of Mexico have been changing the landscape um, since the time of the Aztecs and before, but it was really in the 1950s and 1960s that things ramped up. Um, they moved from just trying to get at tracts of forest by train to getting way up into the highland forests of the Sierra Madres to chop down things and transport it out by truck. And they converted the western lowlands from thorn scrub to agriculture. All this was happening um, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s in Mexico, whereas a lot of that change in California that Grinnell was documenting before and after was happening you know, maybe in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. So just to take you in and zoom in on um, one particular place that Lamb had a chance to go to several times uh, in the mountains of Durango, we can kind of zoom in on this location that's not too far away from where they eventually built the highway from Mazatlan up to Durango. It's a site called Neveros. And zoom in to see some of the, what the habitat is like. Still quite a bit of forest there. But when Lamb first traveled there, um, he says, left early and rode to a place known as Neveros. Today's ride was straight up the mountains for five hours, so the highway was not there. They went on burrows over a terribly rough and stony trail. The country traveled in the last two days has been just a succession of mountain ridges through pine and oak forests. Here it is mostly pines of good size. So that's in 1938. Ten years later, he goes, there is in course of construction a highway from Mazatlan to Durango, much of it being built. Um, a town, La Ciudad, has only, is only some 15 minutes drive to Neveros, where once I had made camp, going by mules from Mazatlan. Now there is a sawmill here, he notes. And then he goes back a few years later in 1951. Now the place is much changed. There is a large, large sawmill and lumber mill and a score or more of houses. Still in parts looks favorable for birds. All the large pines have been logged off. So massive changes that even Lamb was noting throughout his collecting time there, but even accelerated um, after 1951. So these changes and our ability to get DNA out of the specimens was sort of the impetus for um, my next grant, which was really an attempt to bring the whole Moore Lab specimens into a research project and look at change over the last hundred years. Um, and we're calling this the Mexican Bird Resurvey Project. It is very grand in scope, and um, you know, being at Occidental, we do what we can, but um, you know, basically I'm looking for as much help and input and um, we've got a citizen science component as well. I'm trying to bring as many people into this as possible. So I, I welcome your interest, your expertise, and, um, and any help you can lend to the project. The basic idea, there's several parts of it. One is to use Lamb's specimens and his sighting data from his field notes 
to compare to modern distributions of birds. So here we'd just be looking at sites that Lamb collected well and comparing them to modern eBird citizen science data and saying what's changed in the bird distributions over that amount of time. One of the first things we did as part of that was upload all of Lamb's specimen data and all of his locality data. It's our, all of the specimen data is already online on Arctos and BirdNet and GBIF. You can search all of that. But then we put it into eBird, which I think is the first example of a museum collection uploading essentially their database to the citizen science bird observation database. Which you might think, well, it's already all online. I mean, so what? But it actually has resulted in a lot of interesting new information as birders began looking at our data and discovering new state records for Mexico that they didn't know were out there because it was a museum specimen. We put the first uh, records for imperial woodpecker onto eBird, which is an ex extinct species from the mountains of western Mexico. You can bet that raised a few eyebrows when those <laughs> records got looked over by some of the some of the site managers for that area, we immediately got an email, Imperial Woodpecker, are you sure? We're like, well, look at the date, you know, it was collected in 1937. And so, I mean, we didn't even know that this was kind of, that this was going to be so interesting, but actually taking these museum records and putting them on the Citizen Science website, it's, it's been an interesting lesson in how the birding community and the ornithology museum community don't have a lot of crosstalk. And when you increase that crosstalk, um, cool information comes out of it. So some of this resurvey we're, we're doing kind of um, you know, computationally by comparing these records to eBird records. And we're, we're working with Cornell and eBird and some other collaborators kind of figuring out the best way to do that. I know Morgan Tingley, um, I really need to talk to him work on the, the Grinnell Resurvey project and his expertise there. Another thing we're doing is actually going and visiting 15 of these sites and doing um, some resurveys in person. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to really make a good like collection resurvey of these areas. So what we're doing is we're going in with cameras and basically just trying to take pictures of as much as we can and doing a sort of virtual resurvey, uploading all of our records to iNaturalist. So we've made two trips now to the Sierra San Pedro Martir of northern Baja. And uh, all of our records, thousands and thousands of records, not just for birds, but for everything from plants to herbs, um, are available on iNaturalist. Really a uh, beautiful area up there in the San Sierra San Pedro Martir. Um, it was an interesting first place to start on a site resurvey for the Mexican Bird Resurvey Project because maybe more than any other place in North America, it has not changed much over the last hundred years. It got protected very early as a natural reserve in Mexico. Huge pine trees still standing. Even the ones that have died naturally, they've fallen over on the ground and they're still just sitting there. No one's dragged them out for firewood. No one lives up there permanently. And so um, it was kind of a fun place to start. Um, we were doing also a lot of reef photography while we were up there, <coughs> finding these old photographs from Lamb's time and even before in the early 1900s. And, um, you know, there's a tree or two here that are different. This big tree had fallen over, and you could go find it lying down on the ground in the background new trees have sprouted up and grown, but really the story of this place is it hasn't changed much. Here's a couple more. Three photographs are always so fun to, to look at. Couldn't help putting some on the lawn. Here's some that are closer to the coast. You can see they've done some major terraforming there. The coast was quite a bit changed. Um, up in the Highland Mountains was not. Here's another really cool one of an old pine tree that had fallen over and is just still sitting there in the meadow. So we recorded birds. So birds recorded by lamb but missing from our survey um, over here on the left column. You know, we were only there for five, six days at a time, so you might want to put not put too much stock. Would we see an American kestrel if we stayed there for longer? Probably. I'm a little more interested in the birds over here on this list 
the birds not recorded by Lamb but present in our survey, because um, I'm pretty sure Lamb wouldn't have missed something for as long as he was there. Um, an interesting list. I definitely want to focus in on this one bird and not to make too much out of one species, but rock wren was all over this high elevation meadow. One of the most common birds we, were, we would see. There's no way Lamb would have missed this bird when he was there. It seems to be something that has recently colonized the high elevation. It's a bird that likes arid areas. And so you can imagine maybe this is a sign that this high elevation meadow has gotten drier um, through the years. If it hasn't been habitat change, you know, this might be an example of where climate change in general, warmth and aridity has led to a change in a bird distribution. One great story that Lamb recorded and we recorded as well, but with a large period of absence, was a California condor. Um, extirpated from the wild, of course, for many years. The San Diego Zoo was working with Mexican partners to reintroduce the bird to the Sierra San Pedro Martir. And we saw them in great numbers during the time we were there. I saw 30 birds, 30 <laughs> condors soaring, soaring at one time. <clears throat> we are not very far along in the DNA part of the project. We're really just rolling through extractions from, from bird specimens. But we'll be comparing birds um, historical and modern in the highlands and also in the western lowlands that were converted to agriculture. We've got a, a list here of the species that, that we'll be looking at in the highlands and the lowlands. Finally, one kind of fun project because it's both historical and Mexico and involves the bird resurvey but also involves Los Angeles. Um, is looking at these two species of Amazon parrots that are native to Mexico, so the lilac-crowned and the red-crowned parrot. They're both endangered now because of habitat loss and um, the pet trade. And But they've, they're both really common to find in Los Angeles because they've been introduced uh, to the area, escaped pets and so on, and they've, they're now both established and breeding in LA. And so we realized that we have um, historical specimens of these parrots in the Moore lab. And now dead ones do turn up from time to time. And we've managed to get our hands on some of the modern specimens. And we're looking to see if they might be interbreeding. I mean, as you can see with their distribution in the wild, they don't come into contact at all. Um, they're probably maybe a million years <coughs> divergent. But in LA, they're hanging out in mixed species flocks. Mm -hmm. And so we've sequenced 20,000 genomic markers from these Amazons. And this is, these are data of the historical specimens from the Moore lab. So you could consider it pure populations of both species from the 1930s <coughs> before they ever got introduced to LA. You can tell them apart very easily by their genomic profiles. And now here, is a bunch of exemplars of red-crowned or lilac-crowned or maybe mixed birds from LA that are more recent. And what was kind of interesting to me is that most of them um, do fall out as pure red-crowns. I mean, if they look like red-crowns, they genomically are red-crowns with not a lot of evidence for mixing. But we also did find a couple individuals that not only in their phenotype, but in their DNA profiles, are very clear evidence of mixing. So, um, you know, there's kind of an interesting evolutionary story here, but um, also from the perspective of conservation, there's been talk of you know, LA's parrots as being, maybe being like a rescue population where they'd ever go extinct in the wild. And, um, you know, you want to know to what extent they might be hybridizing and mixing if they were going to be that rescue population. So it's kind of a, a fun a fun project. Um, everybody in LA, the parrots have really been increasing in numbers and everybody knows LA's parrots. So it's kind of been fun to, to work on a project that people are pretty jazzed about that also links back to our Mexican bird collection. We are right now in the middle of a huge remodel of the Moore Lab. Um, we're in trailers while the inside uh, is basically gutted. And um, it's been kind of sad, you know, we had that 
the Moore Lab was really it was almost like a time capsule. It was really in state since the time of Moore, and so it was kind of a, a bummer that we will lose some of that vintage history, but we're really, you know, we needed it. We needed new collections cases just for the security of the collection. So we put together um, $12 million to, to gut, the, gut the building, and we're going to be building some new collection space bringing the old Moore Lab library back into the collection, and, um, and also revamping some of our other really cool natural history collections that we have at Occidental. Um, we just got this amazing shell collection, 170,000 shells with data and with um, tissue still attached to them, uh, and, and also an amazing fish collection uh, 40 years of longitudinal data on Southern California nearshore rocky reefs um, through several, a couple CSBR grants from NSF. Um, we're, we're beefing up uh, our collections in general. So uh, with that, I just want to say thank you, especially to collectors and collections managers. I mean, they have been keeping these natural history collections together through you know, some pretty rough times in, in, in previous decades. And people like Chester Lamb, who, um, you know, did so much for, for natural history and for our collection. And also to a very large slate of undergrads and high school students over the last eight years at Occidental. Um, you know, we couldn't make any of our projects go without, without some, some amazing and excellent undergrads. And so uh, with that,